Hi, I'm Dr. Gordo, and welcome to The Raven, The Writing Desk. In this video, we are doing our third look at the Elements of Style by Strunk and White, but this is a standalone video. You can start with this one. Part one of the video was about crafting sentences. Part two was about looking at your work as a composition, considering your writing as a whole. This video is about developing a writing style. If your main interest is, how do I write a professional sounding email, part one and part two of this series will be just fine for you. This video is for writers who want to develop their voice. They want to develop their style. I can give you 21 tips on how to improve your writing style. I'm going to go through them relatively quickly, and then we'll take time to reflect on it all as a whole. So without further ado, let's get going. First point, place yourself in the background. Writing is about writing. It's not about you. And even though you're watching this video because you're trying to develop your voice, you're going to find that it's more about direction. You are in the background of your writing piece, directing the action. While you're doing it, you're not going to be overly concerned about your style or your voice. You're just going to write. Write clear sentences, and you are on your way to writing great things. You just have to remember that practice makes perfect. You need to put in your 5,000 hours, and then after you put that in, put in 10,000 more. You need to do a lot of writing in order to get good at it. When it all comes down to it, all style is, is your confidence in your writing. If you know you are being clear, you have developed style. Write in a way that comes naturally. Don't try to sound like another writer while you're not worrying about your style at all. You're just writing in a way that flows naturally from your mind to the page. You're going to find that the more you read, the better you write. If you are serious about improving your writing, be sure that you are putting in an equal amount of time to reading and writing. See how other people are doing it. See how people are doing it well. And as I'm going to keep mentioning in this video edit, the sign that a writer is developing a style is to have the ability to edit out something that they love. They wrote a sentence, they love it, but it doesn't fit with the composition. And it's not as clever as you originally thought, and you have to Take the time to remove it. Work from a suitable design. This can be as simple as a checklist. It could be a list of topic sentences for an essay or just some questions that you want to be sure to ask. Perhaps it's a longer email. The key here is do not write in a stream of consciousness. Writing in a stream of consciousness can be very good for generating ideas. I just need to get something down on the page. This is what I'm thinking about. The words are just coming to me. I'm getting down on the page. From there, you may be able to derive an outline or some points that you want to develop because then you're going to go into it and plan it much more formally. The point here is if you are going to get good at writing, you're going to need to dedicate a lot of your time to doing it. If the thought of writing that much every day seems daunting, start by writing a journal. Record your thoughts every day. Read something and then record what you thought about it. It's something. And that's where we are right now developing a style is you got to begin somewhere. So start. Write with nouns and verbs. This might seem odd, but a lot of writers when they're trying to develop their voice, they try to find clever ways to use adjectives and adverbs. And of course, these are parts of speech, adjectives and adverbs. However, they're not as important as nouns and verbs. Those parts of speech form ideas. For example, simple idea. 
the plane flew. Article, noun, verb. Now, if I want to add a little layer of description to that, I can say the silver plane flew fast. I'm not saying that I have dramatically improved that sentence with an adjective and adverb. I just want to be sure that I show an example of what this terminology means. The core of your idea should be able to be expressed in nouns and verbs. Again, working with an outline. These are the points you're going to be making. And then as the writing piece develops, you can get with a uh, you can get using some more colorful language. Revise and rewrite. Your first draft is going to have a lot of errors and there's going to be errors in your final draft. A piece of writing in that sense is never completed. A writing piece is completed when you're so tired of it and you need to move on to the next writing project that you hand it in, you close the chapter of that book you're working on, start a new one, what have you. Don't let the fact that a writing piece can always be improved prevent you from being productive. Try different ideas. Try different approaches to a story. But always be thinking, I can't get bogged down. I need to move on to the next point. This is also really important for essay writers, students out there. Oh, I need to make this point and I just can't figure out how to say it. Move on to the next point. You're going to be doing a lot of editing. So do not be afraid of the editing process. That is where you're going to make your corrections. In the meantime, keep moving forward. And when you do do some editing, keep in mind we are our own worst editors because we know what we're trying to say. The idea that is up here appears to be clear on the page, but we can make a lot of mistakes. Getting another set of eyes to look at the paper is invaluable for spotting typos, grammatical errors, spelling errors, or just pointing out this sentence just doesn't make sense. Listen to that kind of advice from an editor. You look at the page and they're probably correct. Now, if the editor is questioning your content, this is where I want new writers to be aware. I've seen online some predatory practices about, oh, I'm an experienced writer, show me your writing piece and I'll give it a sensitivity reading. I'll make sure that your characters are sensitive to the real world. Do not listen to these people. I am just going to leave it at that. Work with an editor who's going to correct your spelling and grammar, but when it comes to developing your voice, that's something you need to develop on your own. Do not overwrite. I have read good ideas that are ruined because the student felt the need to throw in all these colorful details, colorful description to really make the idea come alive and in doing so ruin the writing piece. You're writing with your nouns and verbs and you're only using the adjectives and adverbs when you know, yes, that's a good place for them. Otherwise, I'm always keeping it simple. Express your ideas in as few words as possible. And as I mentioned previously, have the courage to edit out ideas that you love, that you know are just not working. Do not overstate. In other words, don't exaggerate. I find this is one of the worst violations I see online. In order to get clicks, people have to say something sensational. For example, this is the worst movie ever. You've got to hear my review of it. Does, if it is not, in fact, the worst movie ever, I am now going to question that person's judgment. So it's not that you don't get excited about ideas, but don't overstate them. Something that is bad can be bad. It doesn't mean it's the worst thing ever or the best thing ever. Avoid the use of qualifiers. This is getting a little bit more into the nitty gritty of the language, but words like very, really, little, pretty, they don't add anything to a writing piece. It's not that you never ever use these words, but a student may be thinking, oh, I need to write 250 words, so let me throw a bunch of varies and rathers or reallys in there just to get that word count up. 
it only makes the writing sound worse. I'd rather a student give me a hundred words that are tightly knit than 250 words of just loose sentences. Quick pro tip, work with the thesaurus. Instead of saying very big, look at words like gigantic. This is also how you're going to expand your vocabulary and find the best words to express your ideas to the reader. Do not affect a breezy manner. This is another way of just uh, you know, shooting from the hip. We're not that interesting. I'm really trying to do my best to stick to the point because writing should stick to the point. Don't waste the reader's time. Another way that you can sound off is by including slang or curse, curse words for that matter that you get a little too informal in writing. And it happens more and more in professional writing such as newspapers. As you write, remember, simple words are better than complex words. And if you try too hard to be nonchalant with the reader, you're going to come across as pretentious because, of course, you already know about all these big ideas that I'm talking about. And I hope as soon as I put that voice on, you felt a little bit of a cringe there. Don't write like that. Use orthodox spelling. If you know anything about the history of any language is that the spelling of the written word will change over time. And there's a lot of reasons for that we do not need to go into. That said, spelling is standardized. You can look it up in a dictionary. You can look at the proper way to spell a word. If you're to be taken seriously as a writer, spell properly. And you may say, but I do a lot of writing online and people use short forms, they use emojis, and yeah, that's great for online discourse. Again, the point of this video is serious writing pieces, be it an essay, a novel, a screenplay, a really important email. And so let's be sure we're being taken seriously by following the conventions of the language. Do not explain too much. Show, don't tell. This point in particular is important to dialogue. Sometimes your character will share exposition with the audience. One character is explaining to another character what's happening and in doing so provides narration. This can be really helpful to move a plot along, but of course, character is action, according to F. Scott Fitzgerald. Your character should be doing things more than explaining things. Do not construct awkward adverbs. It's a bit redundant after we just talked about the importance of writing in nouns and verbs, but adverbs are the one part of speech that can quickly ruin an idea. If you're not familiar with adverbs, they tend to end in L-Y. They mostly modify a verb. They add some description onto the action. However, be sure it's necessary. So, quick point, you're looking over your writing and you see L-Y words, ask yourself, does that L-Y word really need to be there? Make sure the reader knows who's speaking. Make sure the reader knows who is speaking. You're going to avoid John said, Sally said, through the course of the conversation. It should be clear. And if there's concern that, oh, I want to make sure it's clear that John is saying this, then you put in a John said. Otherwise, watch out for unnecessary description in your dialogue. Avoid fancy words. I mentioned earlier the importance of developing your vocabulary, developing your ability to choose the best word. An important point about style is to know your audience. The best word to use will reflect who you think will be reading this piece. If I am writing to a scientific audience or I'm writing a scientific report, then instead of using the word stomach, I would say intestine. But if I'm doing a casual email, I might refer to a gut feeling as opposed to a feeling in my stomach. If I was writing a children's book, maybe I consider the word tummy for stomach. What is the difference between good writing and bad writing? Basically, whether the writer is being understood. Are the intended ideas coming across? And 
you're going to edit from there. Who is my intended audience? And am I choosing the best words for that audience? Again, having a trusted proofreader can be invaluable. And I stress the word trusted. Someone who is genuinely interested in helping your writing piece become better is a voice you should be listening to. Do not use dialect unless your ear is clear. My advice is do not assume you are that good. Even if it's, oh, but I'm referring to my people. I come from this particular community and people have an interesting twang in their voice. I want to tell a story like they would tell the story. Sounds good until you actually get into the actual writing of the story. And then you'll find that, wow, these characters that I love sound like a bunch of stereotypes. A really good example of this is the recent film American Fiction. Go and see that and you'll know what I mean about, yeah, best stay away from accents. If you must put in an accent, you're going to spell it phonetically, but keep in mind how it's going to appear to someone on the page. The word once, what if your character puts a bit of a t at the end, so it's once, he once. On the page, O-N-C-E-T can appear as onset, and so right away, you're not being clear. Spelling it W-U-N-S-T probably brings that pronunciation closer to what you have in mind, but again, do you really want to write a whole story like this? If you're going to write phonetically, please do it sparingly. Be clear. Clarity is a virtue. I've talked about this at length in all these videos on the element of style. The main job of the writer is to write clearly. If you see something that could potentially confuse the reader, edit. Do something about it. Do not inject opinions. This is a tricky one because, well, what if I'm writing opinion pieces? If you are writing an opinion piece, yes, you have an opinion, but this opinion is based upon an examination of the evidence. You are explaining to the reader why this evidence supports this opinion. In other words, it's not about you. And if that point is not clear, your opinion piece is going to sound quite egotistical. Yes, your writing is going to have a slant, but it doesn't have to have a bias. My advice here is stay humble and remind yourself you are not as interesting as this writing piece. I can make this writing piece interesting for the reader, but I got to focus on the piece itself. Use figures of speech sparingly. Idioms and expressions sound better in oral discourse. Writing is no stranger to comparisons, similes, using like or ends, metaphors, that uses the verb to be. But if you try too hard to have too many metaphors, too many analogies, it's going to muddle the piece and you're not going to be clear. And if you're not being clear, the writing's not good. For example, it can be really easy to mix your metaphors. Here's a terrible one. We are sharks swimming in the hourglass of time. I really hope to your ear that sounds awful. Do not take shortcuts at the cost of clarity. As I frequently say, good writing is tight writing, but the best writing is clear writing. This point mostly comes up when the writer is using an acronym and they're thinking, I'm just going to say the name of the acronym and move on. And I'm going to save myself those words to make my writing piece extra tight. But in doing so, you've probably created confusion. Even if you are convinced everybody knows what these initials mean, what about the people who just came to the English language today? They're not going to know what that means. The first time you use an acronym, say exactly what it means. NATO means the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Now that I've said that once, Going forward, I can keep saying NATO, and I can be confident that the reader is going to be able to follow what I'm saying. 
And if we are talking about a research paper, an essay, something with a lot of acronyms, it's a good idea to contain a list of those acronyms in your appendix. That way, if the reader forgets what something means, it's easy to look it up. Before moving on to the next rule, I would just love to read this passage from The Elements of Style, page 81. The longest way around is usually the shortest way home, and the one truly reliable shortcut in writing is to choose words that are strong and sure-footed to carry readers on their way. A lot of new writers tend to look for shortcuts to finishing a piece. Those writing pieces are not going to be good. Get the idea of shortcuts out of your head if you're going to be really good at writing. Avoid foreign languages. This can be a tricky one. Canada has two official languages, French and English. I've also found that Canadians use a lot of French words that have been borrowed into the English language. Words like rendezvous. If you are writing in English, use English words. English has borrowed heavily from many other languages. And so you're going to get the foreign influence in that way. But if you start dropping in words from other languages, it's just going to make the writing piece less clear. And of course, what do we really want to do in our writing? We want to be clear. Prefer the standard to the offbeat. What this really means is don't overthink it. Imagine a carpenter with a big toolbox. That carpenter doesn't go to a job, dump all the tools on the floor, and then use every tool for that job. Instead, the carpenter is going to open up his toolkit and use whatever tools are needed for that particular job. It's the same with your writing piece. Use the tools you need to use to do the job. Simply put, there is a difference between written English and spoken English. And if you try to write the way you speak, you're going to run into problems. Understand that written language is its own language. Once again, don't be breezy. I mentioned slang in passing, so here's a reminder. Avoid slang in any work that you really want to be respected. Now, what if you're going for nostalgia? There's many episodes of the show Stranger Things, which I could use as examples of good writing because it is telling the story of adolescents who have their own slang and it's taking place in the 80s. So there's a lot of nostalgia there. And so the writers have to be very careful to use slang in the appropriate way to establish that nostalgia without making it sound like Teenagers use those words in everything, every single sentence they ever spoke. Just like we don't use slang in every sentence. If you're using slang, it's mostly because you are writing dialogue and be sure that it's grounded in reality. I find that if I elaborate on this last point, I can get into a general summary of this video as a whole. You need to read if you're going to get good at writing. Read things that you enjoy and then reflect on why you enjoy it. And those lessons have a very good chance of carrying over into your own writing. If you're not sure how to get started, fanfic. Uh, what about those stories that you like reading? What if you could add a short story to that universe? While you're writing it, you want to make sure that this writing piece would be accepted into that universe. It would slide in. Do not use language that's attention-grabbing. If you're not sure what that is, watch advertisements. Advertisements don't worry about being subtle. They want attention because they're trying to sell a product. Don't try to sell your ideas. Tell a story. And you tell a story by having authentic engagement with the reader. And I'd like to elaborate on what I mean by authentic engagement. Don't try to sell a message to the reader. Do not force your own identity into the work. As I keep saying, it's not about you. It's about the story. And the more you can hide identity in the background of the story, the better it's going to be. While you're telling that story, 
know the language of your audience. If you want to write hard science fiction and you want to include a lot of really thick terminology, okay, it may be a story enjoyed by fans of hard science fiction. But if you want a more general audience, use a more general language. Let me illustrate this with an example. What if I were to write a story about the classroom? I would need to avoid the edubabble, all the jargon that I hear on a daily basis, because I want to make sure that the reader relates to this story. I've taught in classrooms around the world, and classrooms tend to be classrooms. So if I use a general language to describe this situation, I'm casting a wide net. And if I can get a reader who's never spent time in a classroom to relate to the idea, to relate to the story that I'm telling, I've achieved an authentic engagement. I have reached the reader, not through forcing a message on that person, but by relating to them. Remember that a writing piece is judged as a whole. Don't let one bad sentence ruin an entire reading piece. Because it can happen. For example, what if I'm writing in the fantasy genre? And so I've read a lot of books that take place in this genre, and I'm setting the scene, I'm picturing an injured knight, and the knight spoke with a labored breath, send for the king. Okay, the squire replied. Why do I have the word okay in a fantasy story? It doesn't belong there. And you might be thinking, but you said to write in clear language, and okay is a clear word. Yes, but I am writing in the fantasy genre. I need to know my audience, and the words that I'm going to use are still going to be clear, but they're going to set the scene. I don't know, maybe the squire should have said something like, at once, but not, okay. You are writing in a way that comes naturally as a result of spending a lot of time reading that genre. As we begin to wrap things up, I want to emphasize proper spelling and grammar. In writing, formal is better than informal. Some in the audience might be thinking, but I thought we were getting away from conventions. I thought we were encouraging people to you know, develop their own voice by not being hampered by proper spelling and grammar. Th that's a terrible idea. If we let people just start writing the way they think it sounds, give it a generation, we're not going to be able to understand each other anymore. We need to stick to convention. We need to conform to it in the same way that an athlete has to conform to the rules of a game. If your child is out there playing a game and making up their own rules as they go along and it's interfering with the game, the other kids aren't having fun, you're going to need to say to your kid, you're not being fun to play with. There's rules and you need to respect them and you need to follow them. Same for professional athletes. Yes, the fans may complain about some rules, but to complain about all the rules is to not like that sport. Conform to the conventions of the language in order to be clear. This is not to say that you need to assimilate your ideas into any, uh, to anyone else. Strunk and white write. No idiom is taboo, no accent forbidden. There is simply a better chance of doing well if the writer holds a steady course, enters the stream of English quietly, and does not thrash about. And what a beautiful way to say you're going to develop your own voice. But in order to get there, you need to respect the rules of the game. Now... If you want to experiment, experiment. That said, I think if you master convention first and you get into experimentation, pioneer possibly some great ideas. But again, learn the conventions first, please. As Strunk and White say, writing is an act of faith, not a trick of grammar. 
you are sending a signal out to the world and you want that signal to be understood. To end things, I like to be a little blunt. No one wants to read a message from a narcissist. No one wants an idea to be overly complicated by wrapping up in a shroud of all these mysterious words. Do not force your beliefs on the reader. You want to tell a story to the reader and you want the reader to enjoy that story. So don't do anything that would annoy you personally. And that's a pretty good rule to follow. To end, I'd like to give you the definition of felicity. Intense happiness or the ability to find appropriate expression in one's thoughts. The writer can experience felicity through felicity. We are talking about taking the three-dimensional world and converting it into a two-dimensional format on the page. But if you really get good at this, the three-dimensional world is intertwined, or so I'm told, with the fourth dimension, we also know it as time. So if you can accurately take that three-dimensional world and put it on the page, you will intertwine that fourth dimension. And that's the quality that can make writing timeless. So I wish you good luck. And hey, I'd love to read your writing if you want to send it my way. But in the meantime, I thank you for your time. Take care.